Welcome to part three of the most invasive species of North America. In previous episodes, we've discussed over a dozen invasive species, some having caused more harm than others. Two species that were previously mentioned are brown trout and largemouth bass. These, unlike some of the traditional invasive species that we tend to think of, are popular sport fish. Sportfish pose an interesting problem as they are what the vast majority of anglers fish for and they generate economic benefits among other recreational opportunities. These fish are loved and appreciated by millions and for these very reasons, sportfish have been widely distributed far beyond their native ranges into countless rivers, lakes, ponds, and streams. This naturally has resulted in both positive and negative consequences. Considering the two major criteria for a species to be regarded as invasive, one, that it has been introduced outside of its native range, and two, that it is causing ecological harm in the areas of introduction, some sport fish do fall under the category of invasive, despite making positive contributions in recreational aspects. Considering sport fish as invasive has the tendency to be a controversial subject as some people value the presence of sport fish more than native fish, and vice versa. Also, it is hard to find public support and funding for conservation efforts regarding the removal of sport fish, as there is always going to be a lot of people raising concern over the subject. Needless to say, I think that the majority of anglers appreciate a healthy mixture of both having a variety of well-managed sport fish amongst conservation of native species. Whatever your take on the subject, it is undeniable that sport fish have altered countless ecosystems. The first couple of fish that will be listed in this video are well-known sport fish that have had a notably negative influence on certain areas outside of their native range. Let's begin with the northern pike. The northern pike is an aggressive ambush predator native to the cooler waters of the northern US and Canada. These fish grow to be very large, making them both a prized target for anglers and also a devastating predator. Northern pike were introduced mostly for sport fishing. Alaska has had a notable problem with invasive northern pike as populations have expanded in some areas of the state, causing extensive damage to the native species like salmon, whitefish, and trout, as most of these fish evolved without such a fierce predator. Unfortunately, there are some records of pike wiping out entire populations of native fish. Next up is the blue catfish, the largest freshwater catfish species in North America. These giants are native to the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio River basins. Blue catfish are a highly welcome species in many areas, but lately they have posed significant problems to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. In the 1970s and 80s, blue catfish were introduced into the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Virginia and Maryland to boost sport fishing. Since then, they've spread rapidly into connected rivers like the James and Potomac. Blue catfish are generalist feeders, meaning that they eat just about everything, including fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and even young waterfowl. They're also highly tolerant of different salinity levels, which has allowed them to invade both freshwater and brackish estuaries. Their biggest impact has been on native fish, including commercially and ecologically important species like American Shad, Blueback Herring, and the Atlantic Sturgeon. Now let's talk about one of the most beloved sport fish, the Rainbow Trout. Native to Pacific drainages in North America, from southern Alaska down through California and northern Mexico, rainbow trout have been introduced all over the world now. This map shows an approximate extent of their current range in North America since they've since extended outside of their native range. While rainbows have been introduced nearly everywhere in the U.S., some notable areas of introduction include high mountain lakes and streams of the Rockies and the Appalachians, also many areas in eastern Canada. Most of these introductions began in the late 1800s for recreational fishing. Rainbow trout pose a similar threat to the species mentioned previously, 
as they compete with and prey on native fish. Yet perhaps an even worse problem is that they hybridize with native trout species, such as cutthroat trout for example, which can lead to a loss of genetically pure native populations. In many places, stocking efforts of rainbow trout have now shifted from stocking to sterile fish rather than fish that can reproduce. Despite all this, rainbow trout sure have brought a lot of people joy, as I imagine it was the first fish for many of you who are watching this. Unfortunately, their history isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Brook trout is one that I will mention just very briefly, as the story is very similar to that of the rainbow trout. The main difference between the two is just flipping the geographical influence, with brook trout being native to the eastern US and Canada, and now being introduced all over the west. Brook trout do especially well in the high alpine lakes of the west, and while they do provide some pretty spectacular sport fishing, they can very easily outcompete other fish species. Usually seen at about 5 inches, the green sunfish is a lot smaller than the previous species listed, but they are still an extremely aggressive species. Green sunfish are native to much of the Midwest, the East, and the Great Plains, and have since been introduced all over. These fish are a very adaptable species, doing well in many different environments. The sheer aggression of these fish is often what allows them to outcompete other small fish species, as they are very quick to strike any potential prey. This last fish isn't a sport fish, and quite honestly, it's an oddball in a few ways. Let's just say that if you have never seen or heard of this fish, you might just think that you have encountered an alien from a horror film. The sea lamprey is a parasitic, eel-like fish with a jawless, round mouth, packed full of sharp, hooked teeth. Instead of biting, it latches onto other fish with its suction cup mouth, scrapes away the skin with its rough tongue, and drains the fish's blood and bodily fluids. Sea lampreys can grow up to be 24 inches long and weigh over 5 pounds. They have a cartilage skeleton and a single nostril on top of their head. They also have seven holes or gill openings on each side of their front end. Sea lampreys are anadromous fish, capable of living in both freshwater and saltwater. Their lifespan is around six to eight years, but they spend most of that time as larvae buried in sediment, filter feeding like worms. In their final 12 to 20 months, they transform into adults, becoming parasitic terrors. Sea lampreys are native to the Atlantic Ocean. In their natural environment, they're just another predator in a balanced ecosystem. So you might wonder, how did these creatures become invasive? In the early 1900s, sea lampreys made their way into the Great Lakes through man-made shipping canals like the Welland Canal, which bypassed Niagara Falls, a natural barrier that had kept them out for thousands of years. Once inside the lakes, they found a buffet of native fish species with no natural defenses. In the Great Lakes, sea lampreys have had a negative impact on many fish populations, especially prized fish species like lake trout, whitefish, and salmon. Just one adult sea lamprey can kill over 40 pounds of fish during its parasitic phase. Their predation has disrupted entire ecosystems and hammered the fishing industry. Controlling them in the Great Lakes has cost hundreds of millions of dollars over the decades through a combination of barriers, traps, and chemical treatments targeted at their larvae. Invasive species can be tough to manage. When it comes to doing your part to help control invasive species, please study up on your local laws and regulations, as not all invasive species are treated the same, especially when it comes to sport fish. I hope you've enjoyed this video and maybe learned something new. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more fish videos, and I hope to see you on the next one.